from his album My Americana, Ernest Turner, on Return of Thanos. You're listening to member supporter radio 90.7 WNCU. And I have within the studio Ernest Turner, but before he gets riled up and on this mic, I just want to let you know that he is an award winning and Grammy nominated pianist and composer Ernest Turner. His professional career has spanned 20 years and has included performances and recordings with some of the biggest names in jazz and pop music, including DeFeo. Marcellus, John Legend, Raphael Sadiq, and the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. And his latest album, which you just heard from, was My Americana, a 2019 album release, offers an understated ode to black American music rooted in an innovative reimagination of pieces by Stevie Wonder, Fats Waller, and others alongside original compositions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Mr. Ernest Turner. Hey, howdy, how are howdy, you? howdy. How is it going? I cannot complain. Thank oh. you for having me. Yes, thank you for agreeing to to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, you do <laughs> out the gate. This is years of study. Years. Where did it all begin? Ooh, uh well, my mother says I started playing around three but I don't know if that's like a mother Mm -hmm. exaggerating when I play but the story is she used to teach piano lessons okay and I would hop up on the piano and kind of mimic whatever they were playing yeah Uh, so she started teaching me Uh, I took a break sometime like middle school I got sick of playing piano Mm -hmm. and then when I resumed I actually resumed with her piano teacher from when she was in college Miss Barbara Cook who taught at Central okay uh, years back Uh, and then from there I think I got I guess, quote unquote, serious. Okay. Yeah, where I was practicing yeah. every day and, and because studying. she made you. By that point, it was more I wanted to. Okay. I think I stopped because my mom was, oh, you can't go outside and play basketball. Yep. You practice. And so <laughs> How long like, did she make you practice? Well, at that age, I think elementary school, it was like 30. It okay. wasn't anything. I wasn't a prodigy or anything like that. I wasn't practicing hours. But by the time I got into middle school, it became. I could tell to make the song sound how I needed them to sound. It became like hours. Mm -hmm. And so that's Mm -hmm. when it became like, okay, I need to at least put in several hours. And then high school, I played in band. Yeah. So you just get used to practicing. And so then it became a thing like, okay, I got to practice three hours a day. It was a concert band? So they, piano for concert? No, no, I played brass. Oh, okay. So that's, I I didn't even know I was going to play piano when I left high school. I was, I played tuba in middle school and Mm -hmm. then high school. And then I started playing trumpet. Okay. So piano was a thing that I played in jazz combo and jazz band. So mm-hmm. it was when I went to New Orleans, I took my trumpet with me. I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> and then I heard the trumpet players in New Orleans. And, and I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not no? playing trumpet. No? Oh, no. I man. mean, you heard the piano players in, in New Orleans Yeah, too, but right? New Orleans is a brass town. Okay, okay. I mean, we just think about like mm-hmm. all the brass. I mean, just starting with Pops. Yeah. You know, Wynn Marcel and Delphio. Mm-hmm. I mean, God, Christian Scott. Mm-hmm. Is, it, it is a brass town. And so is King Oliver from New Orleans? No, I, don't I thought know. I thought Joe Oliver's from Chicago. Joe Oliver, yeah, okay. King Joe Oliver, I think he's Chicago. Okay, okay. Um, okay. But yeah, you hear all those people, mm-hmm. and you're like, no. maybe I need to stick with one. Uh, there's not enough time in the day to get good at one, so let me. And so then I was like, oh, yeah. I need to play piano. Well, you got good at the piano in New Orleans. So, like, what kind of lessons did you learn in school and out? Yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing. I think. I learned the most out of school, okay. which is something yeah. I, I usually tell a lot of younger musicians is school is interesting mm-hmm. when it comes to studying, I think, any kind of performing art because uh, it's, it's a little counterintuitive to what you want to what you're trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you got to follow certain rules. Yeah, and it's and you're kind of at the you're you're kind of at the mercy of your teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's really great if you have a good teacher, Mm -hmm. but then that can be really, really bad if you don't have a good one. So the thing about Mm -hmm. New Orleans was it didn't really matter how my teachers were. Like I had a really, really good, I had two really great private teachers. I had a classical teacher, John Murphy, Mm -hmm. and a jazz teacher, Michael Polera, and they were great. Wow. And so I kind of leaned on that in school. But out of school in New Orleans, I mean, I learned all the things you need to know about music. Okay. I learned. Share some. Well, (laughs) I think the the most difficult thing was that that New Orleans is great at, and I think it's probably exclusive to New Orleans, is there has to be some kind of groove 
or feeling to what you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of times, um, I remember talking to Jimmy Heath about this. Mm -hmm. He was saying he listens, this was back in 2012, but he was saying he listens to a lot of young musicians today. They sound like scientists. Mm -hmm. A lot of technique, a lot of mm -hmm. you know, theory, a lot of harmony, but it's very scientific, kind of, very kind of sterile sounding. Mm -hmm. In New Orleans, nothing is sterile sounding. Okay. So I had to learn kind of the hard way that if you are not doing something that is making that is like resonating with people that it doesn't have some kind of groove or some uh -huh. kind of soul things like not only will the band shun you but the audience will kind of be a little cold too because wow. they're so used to i mean new orleans is participatory oh, yeah. music yeah and so that was one of the big ones um so you establish a groove like i mean that's the main thing establishing do you think about rhythms when you're playing or it just comes out naturally I think when the younger I was, the more I thought about it. Okay. Um, the great thing about New Orleans, and especially as you get older, mm -hmm. I mean, even in other aspects of your life, things become a lot more natural. Mm -hmm. But with music, it just became, you you have to kind of be the amalgamation of like everything that's happened so far. Mm. So all these collective things. So just like, I grew up in a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's going to be a part of it. I grew up playing classical music. That's going to be a part of mm -hmm. it. I grew up in New Orleans. So there's going to be some of that rhythm. And yeah. So I think it's less about you think about it, because um, I think it's like anything. If you have to actually sit and think about, okay, let me play rhythmically now, you will well, sound <laughs> you will sound kind of silly, like a robot. Right, right. Yeah. You're like, it, but you yeah. hear it a lot of times with younger musicians. It's mm. you can tell, oh, I'm trying to do this now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, if I'm a saxophone player, oh, I'm, I'm trying to play like Cold Train mm -hmm, now. And it's like, mm -hmm, oh, but mm -hmm. ten seconds ago, you're playing like Dexter Gordon. Like, this is, <laughs> I mean, can't you incorporate the two? Well, you can incorporate the two, but I think the the difference in playing organically and I, and this is kind of the problem sometimes with what happens with school is you start to think there's well let me play like this because this happened mm. and let me instead of just let me try and figure out a way to fuse all these mm. things together it's mm -hmm. like a lot of times uh, a pianist will sound like monk on a monk tune yeah. Okay. But then if they're playing something else, they'll tr 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 oh. change it up. But the thing is, like, Monk sounded like Monk okay. all the yeah. time. He wasn't yeah. like, oh, well, this is, these are Monk changes. Yeah. Let me sound like Monk. So I think that's when you can get a little too far in your head, like, with the academic side. So for me, it's mm -hmm. let me, and I guess it was a 20-year process, mm -hmm. let me try to sound like myself all the time. Mm. Like just whatever I'm playing, it's going to sound like me. If I'm playing classical music, it's going to smile my like that sounds like Ernest. So it's wow. but it's tough. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been doing this almost tw well no, over 20 years at this point. Right. And I finally over the last few years are like I feel like I can sound like myself no matter what. Wow. Like no matter who I'm playing with, who the drummer or the bass player, it, the, the different horn players, yeah. I can sound like me. Uh, so no, it's a process. Wow. It's a it's a difficult process. Oh my goodness! This sounds like the brand has been created for Ernest Turner. <laughs> yeah, it's a. I, I think you have to make a decision as as an artist. What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so everybody there's there's different. There's many different roles in music, and I think mm -hmm. that's another thing that you can kind of struggle with when you're young. You're not really taught like you don't have to be X, Y, or Z. Like yeah. maybe somebody that you follow, you don't have to do that. There's so many lanes. Like there's lanes for people who are sidemen that are composers. Yes. There's lanes for people who are just composers. There's lanes for people who are uh, band leaders. There's mm -hmm. so there's all these different ones. And I think I knew at a at a younger age, it's like I feel like I have a very individual voice. Mm -hmm. Being a sideman might not be mm. the route for me. Yeah. Because it's just not gonna. I'm gonna bump heads too much with whomever <laughs> hires me. Uh, and so I had to make a decision uh, years ago where it was just like, mm -hmm. I have to kind of worry about my my sound and my stuff. And if I lose work, yeah. then that's just part of, wow. you know, but then there's other people who they're, they're great as a side man, mm -hmm. you know, like Red mm -hmm. Garland and Wynton Kelly. They mm -hmm. sound great as side man. It's like this is, you know, perfect kind of music that, that went along with what Miles or Coltrane were playing. Did you compare their work um, as a side man versus as a leader on their track? Just to understand. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of that with with a lot of people to kind of to try and kind of suss out or do people change. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for the most part, what I heard is the, I think the biggest change I heard, which to me was kind of the example of a person who could 
kind of slide and change their sound for both was Oscar Peterson. Because mm. Oscar mm. Peterson, when you hear him with Clark Terry mm -hmm. or like any of those, um, like Lester Young, when he's like accompanying somebody, mm -hmm. it sounds like Nat King Cole, which is a whole nother story. I mean, wow. Oscar loved Nat King Cole. There's, okay. a, there's an album of Oscar singing and you think it's Nat King Cole. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's just a decision you have to make. And I have yeah. been a side man. Mm -hmm. um, you did know. you feel like you were bursting at the seams? Like I need to no, be in the see, limelight. No, that was the good thing. Okay, it's, when I did so, the records I was a side man um, was the two records with Stephen Riley, mm -hmm. and then the record with Brian Horton, okay. where I was a side man. But it was more of they wanted me to play how I play. And that Rafia Sadiq. Oh song. yeah, I mean doing. And let's see, that was actually a cool thing. Yeah, he specifically said just play. It sounded great, and I want them to hear it. But before we let them hear it, I, I hear the change that you speak of. Right. And there's a song that you've placed on your album where you recorded We Shall Overcome. Ah. And uh, you definitely changed the, the way that you approach this song. You know, we it's a nice uh, hymn, a spiritual. Right, right. So why did you change it? Uh, At least change the rhythm, the approach. I think... It's it's kind of in line with how I see everything, not just music mm. is. I have a very personal way of doing everything, mm -hmm. of the way I see things, the way I talk, the way I move anything. So mm -hmm. it's it was I had been listening to that song, I mean, for for years <laughs> since I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, I just remember yeah. Black History Month in church. Yep. They're going <laughs> to sing We Shall Over. So it's just something that you've gotten used to hearing. And so my idea was like, well, what can I do? to uh, with with any style of music it's like well i want to keep in the tradition of the song mm -hmm. where people recognize it mm -hmm. and there's like a visceral response they have to the song mm -hmm. but then there's something else that you can almost add on top of yes. it yes not take away from it just like okay it's here let me add on top of it and that uh, so that's did. probably how i looked at it when performing that one mm -hmm. well you did that and it sounds great so i want to let our listeners know that we're in the WNCU Cares Artist Series with Ernest Turner, and he has his album that we're playing, and another um, and more songs that we're going to hear from him later down in the uh, conversation on air conversation. So sit back and relax, and here is "We Shall Overcome" from Ernest Turner's album "My Americana."
90.7 WNCU member supported radio, the sound of Ernest Turner on We Shall Overcome. And, you know, it, that means something. It, it holds true to today, especially in these times. I mean, it's always going to be a point of we're overcoming something. Right. So did you, you know, when you decided to write this song, the thought process was like, okay, well, I'm, you actually shared it, that with us that, you know, uh, you just wanted to change something that had a, a structure, but you wanted to add to it. A little bit. Yeah. A, a little bit. Well, you added a nice amount well, to you. it. Thank yes. You. Now, you have another song on your album called um, Precious Lord. Yes. And you had a story yes. to share. Yes, especially appropriate for NCU Jazz. Uh, yes. So... In middle school, I guess around the time I started to get more serious about playing, um, one of my mother's friends from when she was at Central, Arnold George, who is a professor here, Mm -hmm. um, actually taught me uh, how to play my first hymn, Mm. which happened to be Precious Lord, uh, which I already kind of, I was starting to learn how to play because my I never met my grandfather, who I'm named after, Ernest Turner. Okay. But it was his favorite hymn. Okay. Um, and so it was like one of the first songs I like learned because I didn't I didn't grow up playing in church. I grew up in church, but I didn't play in church. Okay. So it was one of the first hymns I learned. And so Arnold heard me play it, mm-hmm. and he was like, "Okay, well try, try this, try this intro, which is actually the intro out of kind of you know homage to him. I played that intro on the record, the same mm-hmm. intro he taught me. But what it is is just a basic gospel intro. Mm-hmm. And at that time, at 11 I didn't know what it was Mm -hmm. I was just like oh this sounds cool but after I started playing at church I was like oh this is like the standard walk up for how you play Ah, so uh, okay so yeah it's a song that's kind of meaningful to me um yeah over the years like I played it when my uncle passed uh, about four years ago I played it at his funeral like Mm -hmm. I said it was played at my grandfather's um I even remember when I recorded in studio uh, because everybody had taken a break and I recorded and i I remember listening back to what I had to kind of take a little break because it's, um, but it is, it's a song that's like yeah. very meaningful to me just for a myriad of reasons. Like I said, starting with yeah. one of the first hymns I learned and then just what it meant to my, my grandfather and yeah. me playing it for my uncle. So, yeah. so yeah, but this one, I, I don't think I changed at all. It was, mm-hmm. I intentionally was like, let me do this as meat and potatoes and basic <laughs> and just yeah. almost prayer like as possible. Mm. Yeah. Now, now when you say, taking a break you you got a little sentimental yeah definitely okay. um because let's see because i recorded this album fall of eight so yeah my my uncle had been gone two years at that point mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so yeah just that and i mean i'm big in the belief of like ancestral energy mm-hmm. and so it was one of those i remember after my uncle's funeral i sat in the church mm-hmm. which saint stephen's church small church in inez north carolina which okay. is for people who know anything about north carolina it's right outside of warrington so oh, warrington wow. is small yes inez <laughs> is past warrington and even smaller than um you so i remember sitting in the church mm-hmm. and there's this photo up of my grandfather mm. and i just kind of sat there and it was empty everybody was eating and I just kind of felt like this is where my ancestors worshipped. Mm. And so it's like, you know, I was thinking about that when I played the song. And, yeah. and so, yeah, it kind of it kind of got to me a little bit. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, that's so beautiful to have sense. Sen- what is the word? To be sensitive to the music right. and the, the vibration. Right. Well, let's listen to Precious Lord here at Member Supporter Radio 90.7 WNCU.
precious lord ernest turner wow i can see how you can you got uh sentimental on right, that song right wow mm. that says a lot you've been you you really put your flair into these songs i mean there's just something some feeling that goes behind each note that it has been played i remember listening to it in the past week just really getting a feel for your sound right because, I mean, we know each other outside of Right, this. right. And I, I remember playing on one one performance with you, and you sent me for a loop. I think we were playing Impressions. And I was uh, <laughs> you put some substitutions on the right. I said, okay, I don't know if I can hang, but right, I, I'm going right. to try my best. But, yeah, so you, you add so much to what's already there. It, it, you, it, it's a tightrope because you mm-hmm. have to be intentional about what, about what you play. Mm-hmm. I think that's first. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, I think that about anything. I think a lot of times when I, I know me personally, when I have problems with how people play and just how people are, is that not being intentional? Mm. Um, mm. And I think it's easy to do that with music, where you could just kind of phone it in and be like, okay, well, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to be on autopilot and just play. Like I learned, uh, let's say I learned all these licks. I'm just going to oh D yeah. minor. Play my D minor licks, uh, and mm. I think my thing has always been. I need to learn, you know, all these things. I need to learn, you know, historically, you know, the piano. I need to learn, mm-hmm. you know, all the different styles so that I can take all these things. And then it's almost like having a debate with somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a lot of information, you can, you know, you kind of bounce off of different points and yeah. go here and go here. And I feel like music's the same. It's like, okay, well, if I take all this information. When it's time to improvise, mm-hmm. I can literally improvise. Mm-hmm. I can just mm-hmm. kind of, and I can be intentional because I can say, okay, well, I can do all these things, but what is the most appropriate thing right. to do in this moment with the way the drummer is playing and the way the bassist is playing? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But the reason I say it's a tightrope is that takes years too because there were years where, especially when I was younger, where you're playing too much because mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. don't know how to edit yourself. Mm-hmm. Cause you're just like, oh, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, mm-hmm. and you don't know how to play. Like, well, no, that's not the most appropriate thing to play in that moment. I, I mean, even I mean, I'm pushing forty now. Even now, mm-hmm. there's been gigs I've done, especially when I, you know, early this year when I toured with Rafael Sadiq, mm-hmm. where I had to learn that I can play like myself, yeah. but he's a professional, like famous singer. Yeah, he is the most important thing. I have to figure out how to mm-hmm. do what I do. Mm-hmm. but still make it fit underneath him. So mm-hmm. it's like you have to, so it's a juggling mm-hmm. act. Um, yeah. yeah. But no, for me, it's 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 the only way I know how to play. Like I don't, I like somebody asked me years ago, uh, one of my best friends when we were in college, he was like, would you play with jazz at Lincoln Center? And I said, absolutely not. Oh. I said, if I was ever offered that, because I know there's a certain style okay. that if you're the pianist in jazz at Lincoln Center, that you either do that, Okay. Or, like you can't. It's not. A, it's not really. It's not the group for individuality so much. Okay. Now if Wayne Shorter called me to play in this quartet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So even when I was twenty, twenty one, I was just like, "Come hell or high water, I'm gonna play how I yeah. play." Because if not, I should have just be, been a doctor. Or something. <laughs> I should have just done something else. If I have to, like, do, you know, this is music I should be able to create. If I have to mm-hmm. do it for other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 a tightrope of let me be intentional about what I'm playing. Let me always play like myself. But, you know, am I supporting? It is the music the most important thing. Mm-hmm, and so that's mm-hmm. what takes years of maturity to just to be like, it's not me. Yeah. It's I'm just supporting, you know, I'm playing the same music Coltrane played. If mm-hmm. he wasn't bigger than it, then I need to get out the way. Wow. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that that, mm-hmm. that part's hard. It mm-hmm. takes it takes work takes work it takes dedication all of that time energy and effort and that's what you're putting in 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 the music right um do you do any um online classes or do you do any type of uh jam sessions online i i put up one i think right when we kind of got quarantined Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i had a little jam session with john curry and Mm. i I forget the guitarist name uh it's a cat i know plays a lot of like gospel and pocket stuff okay Uh, but I didn't really put it up because I was just like, it, it. I don't know. Like, I see people do it. It feels weird. Yeah, like you're almost prostituting the art. A, a little <laughs> bit. And, 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 it's, and it's cold. Okay. It's, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think 
I don't know. I just never like I, I do the same thing I've done the whole time. Like I'll put up some clips of of me playing something, yeah. put them up on YouTube or Instagram. But yeah. just I was doing that before. Mm-hmm. But like trying to do sessions or concerts online, it's contrived. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean I actually have one that I have to do uh, next month at the Cam in Wilmington where it'll be oh. streaming. But I think there'll be a few people that will be inside okay. and there'll be some people that can kind of come outside. So it'll kind of be, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. Um, yeah. But yeah, lessons, I, I don't know. I, I kind of had my field of teaching. Okay. So yeah, I don't teach. Uh, I teach I, every blue moon now. Like I might give somebody a lesson, but no, I, I, I had my feel of that. Yeah, because you yeah. taught at uh, Eastern Carolina. Yeah, 2006 to 2010. So I feel wow. like I did my time. I served my time. <laughs> oh, there's some more time to be served. Right, I mean, right. You're an educator at some always, point, right? Yeah, at yeah. some point when you're really seasoned, right? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, you re- rhythmicize, as I call it, or it's been called uh, Monk's Dream. And a lot of your playing, you I hear a lot of Monk in your playing. Thelonious yeah. Monk. Oh, yeah. Says, Monk... Uh, I have an interesting relationship with Monk because when I was in college, I hated Monk. Mm. But I Why? hated Monk for the same reason I hated Miles. Like, if, okay. if somebody said pick a trumpet player, Dizzy or Miles, I'd be like, Dizzy. Okay. But because when I was younger, it was Dizzy played more notes. Okay. He played higher. Okay. He played more notes. He had flair. He puffed out the cheeks. Yeah. It was like a... So when you're a teenager or a 20, you're like, oh, I want to play fast. I want to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's the same reason why when I listen to Monk, I mean, my initial reaction was like, oh, he can't play. Mm. Because I didn't hear what I heard Bud Powell do. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. didn't hear, like, at the time I was really into Chick Korea and Keith mm. Jarrett. And I was like, I don't hear, where's all the flair? Like, yeah. I hear these, it sounds broken. Ooh. It sounds like he's, like, in between notes yeah. and all these kind of things. But, like, many things in my life, as you get older, you start to look at the depth of something. Mm-hmm. So I guess mm-hmm. it's, um, you, you start to look at, you know, does anything have substance to it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so as I got older, I realized, oh, Monk is like almost the, the epitome of substance mm-hmm. because actually he became almost like my spirit animal. Hmm. Of if you want to play like yourself and you do not care what the yeah. popular opinion is about your playing, there is no better person to follow than Thelonious Monk. I mean, because I mean, Train was similar. Train was not appreciated. Bird was not appreciated at the time. Amazingly, you know. So, <laughs> I look at Monk, and I was just like, okay, that's actually the person that, you know. As I started to get more into his music, I realized like, oh, like this is what I want to do. Yeah. I want to play how I play, whether it works for people or not, because I believe in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, and then also you start to understand like the uh, conceptual side of what Monk's doing. And then mm-hmm. you start studying, you're like, oh, Monk and Duke Ellington were playing very similar styles, mm-hmm. like so, how they would use clusters, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, how they would use the lower end of the keyboard for like rhythmic effect or for, I mean, it's just all these kind of things where you're like, oh, like Monk is it. Like Monk, yeah. is, Monk is the guy. So, so he's the foundation and then... Yeah, it's just it's just so mm-hmm. many things about and it, and again it's just like if you are talking about playing with like being intentional about playing mm-hmm. and you don't say Thelonious Monk and it's like okay well we're talking about two different things like mm-hmm. he is the definition of I am going to play this chord the way I want to play it because mm-hmm. this is how I hear it mm-hmm. so yeah I think I got yeah. in the Monk it was yeah. it, I mean after I left New Orleans it was probably I mean I'm 38 now I would say I got into Monk maybe mid to late 20s. Okay. When I really like started listening to him, trying to transcribe and trying to get inside the sound. And obviously, as soon as I did it, like my playing changed. Wow. Like I started editing my playing more. I okay. started realizing like I need to be more rhythmic here and I need to, you know, lay out here, do these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if I'll actually do it, but I, I have a feeling that I want to have a Monk song on any record I do. I like always should just have this at least one. I just want to kind of make it a tradition. Like, yeah, there's going to be a Thelonious Monk song on every record that I'm a leader. So. You should. I mean, I'm looking forward to the next album. Certainly uh, love this album that you have. This album I'm speaking about, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really I'm just caught in this conversation. But I know somebody's listening out there. Uh, you're listening to WNTU Cares Artist Series. And today's guest is Ernest Turner pianist educator and composer has played on several albums and he's just continues to keep jazz alive through his music and the culture and the experience so 
I'm excited to play uh, Monk's Dream next. But before we do, we're going to play a little, um, a few promos, and then we'll get to Monk's Dream. And we'll be back here at Member Supported Radio 90.7 WNCU.
and he still had more to give. That was Ernest Turner on Monk's Dream, his take on Monk's Dream, and fabulous, sounding great. You're listening to WNTU Cares Artist Series with Ernest Turner in the seat, and he's sharing some great stories today. Um, You can actually find him on ErnestTurner.com. He mentioned, you mentioned you had a, a show coming up, but I imagine it's online at it's the a, Cam Art Center. Yeah, virtual. It's going to be a virtual. streaming show with mm-hmm. um, Jeremy Bean Clemens and uh, oh, Kevin God. Beardsley on bass. Yeah, so we'll be, we were scheduled to do, it's from the Come Here North Carolina series. Okay. So uh, we were supposed to do it in March, and then, of course, 2020 yeah. happened. So right. uh, <laughs> The great year, yeah, 2020. Great year. Oh, goodness. We, have to, we have to be positive, right? Right, yeah, so... It was supposed to be in March, but so we're mm-hmm. going to reschedule it for next month. I think it's September 10th, and I'm sure it's going to be. I mean, I'll be putting up where they stream it and all yeah. that stuff soon. So, so we can follow you on Instagram. It e, is it E Turner. It's Ernest Turner Music. Ernest Turner Music. It's Ernest Turner Music. Yep, on Instagram. Yep. Are you on Facebook more or Instagram? Uh, or any of those? Like, I don't feel like I'm on either yeah, a lot. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's something I realize. You kind of gotta, you gotta kind of be the used car salesman and <laughs> kind of pimp yourself out on Instagram. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm i on Instagram more now trying to post things and music and all that, trying to, so. Right. I mean, who else is going to hype you well, up? Well, yeah. But you have a lot of cred- credentials, so I'm certain somebody's too Well, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, be more vocal mm-hmm. about what I've done mm-hmm. myself, which I hate. Oh. I'm one of those people who's just like, if, you know, I know, like the music is supposed to do it, but I realize that's not how yeah. the world works. You gotta, you kind of gotta toot your own horn. So, no, I've been mm-hmm. better about it lately. Like, well, let me put up stuff and yeah. clips and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Maybe it's the artist, artist in you that, that kind of holds back, you know, this is my, my baby, my project, and I don't want to just sell it to anybody. Yeah. I mean, what did uh, Erica Badu say back in the. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm an artist and I'm yeah, sensitive. sensitive. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's part of that, but I think it's also I, I'm such a matter of fact kind of person sometimes that I don't I miss like some of those details. Like I'm worried mm-hmm. about well, I just need to make sure that the music sounds good. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was talking to John Curry about it, um, and he was just saying because he always gets on my case about like when I put up videos and they look bad. He's mm. just like, man, I don't care. I don't want to watch this because it looks. I was like, well, I don't care. It sounds good. so. I mean, but he, I, I see his point where it's, it is a yeah. my generation missed that mm. social media window. Okay, we didn't grow up with it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there was Black Planet. Like oh, you graduated no. a year before yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, I guess Black school. Planet, but even, <laughs> even MySpace, that, like the idea of actually putting yourself mm-hmm. up somewhere every day. Yeah, well, like, yeah, several times You're a right. week. I mean, mm-hmm. Facebook. I mean, I, I think I was getting ready to graduate college mm-hmm. when Facebook came out. Okay. So I mean, I don't remember when Instagram, but that that had that what that's not that old. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the idea of like, okay, I have to incorporate this, and so it's something I'm trying to do. But it's I can tell people, mm-hmm. you know, in their like late 20s like people who are like under 30 yeah. oh, like musicians like that are all over it yeah yeah they and are. they even have like built-in followers because all their friends are all over it so but no i realized it's a tool and so like, they fit right in with the virtual online uh way that we are now so that's not a problem for well them. yeah no yeah that's <laughs> not even <laughs> <laughs> it's it has its, it has its merits it, yeah. it, it does does it well we're about to hit the top of the set but i wanted to uh, i know that you've played a stevie wonder cover ah, yes. probably several but on your album you placed uh if it's magic yes now is there a story with that or we i've always loved stevie wonder mm-hmm. so i mean it could have been any one of his i i wanted a quote him ballad or something slower mm-hmm. and i mean well, shoot with stevie i could have picked uh, i yeah. mean it's you could have picked any, any one of a number what i i guess i was just listening to mm-hmm. i had stevie wonder on apple music and then i heard this one i was like this is what i'm gonna do no mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was this more of a popular song that you used to listen to or i mean i'm familiar with if it's magic but yeah. It what it was just something that when I heard it I was like this is gonna work. Yeah, okay. It's just one of those you like. Let's I'm gonna do this one. Yeah. Well, let's let it work. Uh, I'm gonna play another promo and then we'll get right into if it's magic, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to WNTU Cares Artist Series, and if we have time, I'll hop back in. But if not, join us for the next hour of WNTU Cares Artist Series at Member Supported Radio, ninety point seven WNCU.
90.7 WNTU member supported radio. This is WNTU Cares Artist Series with Ernest Turner in the station. And I really wish I had an applause button because I would I would press it right now. <sighs> I just I've it's a breath of fresh air to listen to your music. And I know I keep on saying it, but I mean it. Um, that was Fats Waller's Ain't Misbehaving. And you just took another, what, what did you call it? The I pleasantly. Guess pleasantly deconstructing. Deconstructing. Yeah, deconstruction, pleasantly deconstructing things, yeah. And I ask you, how do you pleasantly deconstruct a tune? Yeah, I mean, because we talked about it a little bit off air. It's yeah. very easy to to ruin songs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess you have to find a sweet spot of how can I play this and it's still recognizable or it still has, I guess, whatever people enjoyed about it on, on some level. Yeah. So it's almost like I don't want to take away from the song. Mm-hmm. How can I add to it? Um, and the thing about, I know for me, like every time I hear people play, when you talk about like something like an aim misbehaving or like standards from that kind of, I guess like the, Tin Pan Alley kind of vibe, yeah. that, that show tune kind of sounding thing. It mm-hmm. always ended up sounding the same. Yeah. Like they would do an arrangement of it, might have some hits in it, or mm-hmm. I was like, no, if I'm gonna play it, yeah, I want to do something, you know, like kind of off. Mm-hmm. Where it's just like it, you know, it's ain't misbehaving, but it's it felt New Orleans. It felt. It, I mean, it's, it's it a, a lot of different groove. things. Yeah, it's got like rock at some point. It's mm-hmm. just like, well, what can I do to just to. And I think, but you have to be honest, you like, I can't, I'm not trying to make it more interesting. Because I mm. think that's when you start thinking, like, you're bigger than. But that song was more interesting See, than I don't normally. think so, though. Like, when, okay. when, I, when I hear Fats Waller, like, it's his stuff is plenty interesting. To yeah. me, it's just, it's almost like, it's not like a higher than or lower than. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, okay, his was interesting this way to the right. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me take his song and make it interesting to the left. Uh-huh. Um, you know, so that's how I kind of looked at it. It's like, well, what can I do just to where people hear this and they're like, oh, I would have never thought yeah, to yeah. do it that way. But it's not contrived. It's not like weird. Mm-hmm. Like it sounds mm-hmm. natural, but it's just a very different, you know, kind of vibe. Well, if I were at your concert and you played this song, I would certainly dance. I would find some corner. Right. Or either <laughs> to do something. Yeah. Right. Cause it, I mean, well, the pulse is, is important, too. And you kept that alive and well. Uh, so we have Ain't Misbehaving is a popular tune of like the 19, I'll say 20s, 13, I think so. 2010. I think the 30s, yeah. 30s. I think, yeah. So you also play popular music of today when you were playing with Raphael Sadiq's band. So how did you get in line with Raphael Sadiq? Uh, so uh, a very close friend of mine that I went to college with at Loyola in New Orleans, mm-hmm. um, He he's a trumpet player. He moved to L.A. Mm-hmm. And so... He actually moved to L.A. off of, he was playing horns for Raphael Sadiq. Mm-hmm. So he, he's going on to do a whole bunch of stuff, you know, playing like all those big, you know, American Idol and all those. So he's becoming like one of the plugged in people mm-hmm. um, and kind of has become like a right hand man to Raphael, um, like doing a lot of writing and arranging. He's actually did a lot of arranging on John Legend's record, mm. the Christmas record. Um, the one you were singing on? No, no, no the one, that was playing, a special. That was yeah, a special? The, the, yeah, when I got caught not singing. <laughs> uh, and so a couple of years ago, he had me come out. He just wanted to, he asked Raphael, could he use his studio just to record some of his stuff, mm-hmm. just to get it on. But it was also kind of he wanted Raphael to hear me, so it was kind of like yeah. a little back-end way. Nice. And so fortunately, um, it's what, what I kind of tell people, is like, you know, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Mm-hmm. And so Raphael heard Can you say me, that, that yeah, again? If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Oh, so, my goodness. I mean, it's one of those where even though I wasn't really doing the gigs I wanted to be doing, you know, things didn't really – my career hadn't taken the path I thought it was going to take when I was mm-hmm. 18, which mm-hmm. is – I mean, life doesn't take the path you think it's going to take. So you thought you were going to be a rock star at 18? No, I mean, when I was 18, I thought okay. by the time I was in my 30s, you know, I'd be doing a lot of tours with people or okay. maybe have my own. And so when that doesn't happen as quickly mm-hmm. as you think it's supposed to happen, um, I don't I don't think necessarily you, you start to lose faith, but you do start to question, hmm. you know, did I miscalculate something some, mm. some way? But through all that, I was still practicing, mm-hmm. still doing stuff. So when I went to L.A. and played, 
me and Raphael like hit it off instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, talked to like he he loved the way I played. Yeah. Uh, and so later that year, when he uh, produced John Legend's Christmas record, they asked me to play on a couple of those. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was in town when they were filming the Christmas special, Raphael was like, hey, can you come by the studio? I want you to record something. Now, at the time, I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so he played a song for me. He's like, all right, play on it. And so I just went in the studio and I just played. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, I listened to it, took one take. He's like, all right, man, thanks. That's it. And so then a couple of years later, like I get some stuff in, the, um, like I get a call like, yeah, we need you to sign these contracts because Ooh. it's going to be released Ooh. on part of it. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm gonna be, and it said like featuring Ernest Turner. But at the time, nice. I didn't know it was just a track. Yeah, yeah. But the thing I like about him, uh, when I did that, he didn't, he didn't say play any kind of, mm-hmm. he just said just play. He said, I want to, like, how you play is what I, you know, want. And so when Mm -hmm. the tour came up, um, because I had no idea what we were going to do, I thought when I got called, because I got called from the tour December of last year, and the tour was, like, Mm -hmm. starting in February, so it was, like, a very quick. Wow. And so I didn't know, like, so I just learned his songs, like, as is. I was like, I don't know if he wants me just to be that kind of keyboard player playing simps. Yeah. I was like, that's not my thing, but, I mean, I'll go do it. (laughs) Yeah. But when I got there... He's like, oh no, he's like, I want you to play, wow, like how you play. So we had about two weeks of rehearsals, mm-hmm. um, and during that, it was just a lot of we would just play through stuff, and I'd be like, hey man, how you feel about this? Mm-hmm. He'd be like, okay, yeah, let's do. So he was, I mean, he's a, I mean, he's famous, but he's a band guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's in the music. He listens to a lot of music. He plays bass mm-hmm. well. You, you say he played. I didn't know he played with Prince. Yeah, so you told played, me that was his first, first gig, gig. I think his first big gig was playing. I mean, he grew up playing bass in church. Can wow. play drums. Can mm-hmm. play a little keyboard. So I mean, he's a musician. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for him, I guess getting me was like a kid in the candy store because mm-hmm. it was like I can play things that he might not have thought of. Yeah. And so then we're just trying to figure out like how to like get it to fit. Yeah. Um, so no the, so the tour was great. You know, just being able to actually play how I play mm-hmm. on that kind of scale. Mm-hmm. But then also realizing, you know, it's always got to fit. Yeah. You know, like, um, but I mean, it's great to work with a person like that who not only allows you, like, the freedom of expression, but, like, encourages it. Mm-hmm. You know, so, mm-hmm. like, we did It Never Rains in Southern California. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, man, well, how would you feel if I just played this? Like some substitution yeah, or something? Yeah, he basically was like, all right. <laughs> so I basically got to remake a song I grew up you know, oh, listening to. So, but no, he's he's great. Um, yeah, yeah. And then just the lessons from hanging out with a person who's been in the music business that long. Mm-hmm. Um, just contractual stuff, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. how this happened, like what happened with this, and you know. So it was it was a it was a great experience, especially I think when you're a primarily a jazz musician, right. you're used to playing for smaller much quieter crowds mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it's a much different thing when like the lights come on and it's like a thousand people standing like ready for like yeah. no we want we want the hits yeah yeah um, but no he he's great like doing that was great um like i kind of feel fortunate to get plugged in with that so uh but no the first time i heard um my playing mm-hmm. on the song uh glory to the veins was when it came out Wow. Like I, Cause I just forgot about it. Oh. And so I heard okay. it when it released. I was like, oh, okay, that's, okay, that's cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so yeah. Before we get to that song, you had mentioned something about the, you know, the music industry and the game and learning the ropes, if you will. And so I noticed that you are you you own your own. Um, is it your? You have your own label, correct? Uh, not no? my own label, but I am. I have like my own LLC and all that okay. kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And I release my record independently. Yeah. That's great. I mean, for all you independent artists, maybe you should uh, call up Ernest Turner nice. and, and put a master class together or something and teach us. Tell us how it goes. So let's listen to Glory to the Veins featuring Ernest Turner, Rafael Sadiq and Ernest Turner. Now, it says Jimmy. Is there, um, I think we have Jimmy. Jimmy Lee. That's Jimmy the name Lee. of the, yeah, it was a, a brother of his that actually died from okay. uh, drug use. Oh, so the whole record yeah. is basically about like addiction. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was, a. Uh, I mean, it was part, and a part of the tour, like he would talk about that, mm-hmm. like when we get to certain songs. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, I think that record was dedicated. It was almost like cathartic for him, mm-hmm. like a record dedicated to his brother. Yep. Well, let's just listen to this healing here at member supporter radio, 90.7 WNCU. i 
90.7 WNCU. Oh, my goodness. That sounded good. I, I wish that you were on there a little bit more, but I know how it is in the pop culture. We have to cut and paste. Right, right. <laughs> Can't keep you on there forever. It's not a jazz album. Right. Okay? It's, it's, it's not my song. <laughs> it's not it's, your song, so yeah. you sit back down. No, it was good, though. That was tasteful. Tasteful what they did. So, I mean, kudos to blending the music. Right. Blending the genres. But I know earlier I mentioned that you, well, I would said it offline, that you are able to put the music um the structure or the foundation of jazz and improvisation into any type of genre of music and right. make it sound good. When you would listen to, um, as a child, I guess listening to uh, classical music, maybe or maybe not, did you take some of those ideas and transcribe them and, and transfer those? Definitely. I mean, any mm-hmm. anything I've, I've ever played, I would do that with. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could have been uh, a song that was popular at the time that I might have learned or... Uh, like looking through some of my mom's music, like she would have like musicals when she taught music uh, K through five. So whatever it was, mm-hmm. if I found something that I enjoyed or that I liked, I'm like, let me take that. So uh, I mean, yeah. in high school, when I started to get more serious about jazz, one of the pieces I had to play for my college auditions was Chopin's uh, Revolutionary Etude. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just Etude in C minor. Mm-hmm. And the start of it is basically this five, this G7 chord five getting ready to go to C minor. But the way he does it, I was like, oh, this is almost like the altered stuff that I'm starting to learn about. Mm. And so it's like I would start to piece, so it's basically piecing whatever together. I mean, when you listen to Art Tatum, yeah. it's obvious. Yeah, uh, I mean, he was checking out like classical music and like yeah. and kind of putting those things into like how he's playing. So I think mm-hmm. any artist, you're, you're borrowing from everything. Mm-hmm. It's when I first... Um, like I, I play Thelonious a lot. Uh, Thelonious Monk's tune, Thelonious. Da 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 da. You know, oh, I play that. Oh yes. And the first thing I heard when I was starting to like, think of an arrangement was all about the Benjamins. Ah. Da 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 da. You know, yeah, so, it's like, yeah. so, so you're going to play whatever yeah. you hear. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about this song that I heard Nicholas Payton play called uh, on Sonic Trance called "I'm Trying to Swing as Little as Possible." Mm. And it's kind of had a similar. So it's like you're going to borrow. Mm-hmm. from whatever experiences you have. I think the goal of an artist is where you're open enough, mm-hmm. where it's almost like you're just open enough where you just can let whatever come in, and mm-hmm. then you can just filter it and send it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like Bruce Lee says, like, be water. Mm-hmm. So it's like, be flexible. It's like, okay, you know, like I don't want to be a stylist. So I think a stylist is a person where you might be listening to a record. You're like, oh, this person sounds just like Oscar Peterson. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my thing is like, no, let me take all those things and create a sound and now yeah. use all these experiences, classical music, gospel music, um, New Orleans music, mm-hmm. pop music, you know, whatever you're hearing, and then you can kind of like put all that together and be like, all right, here, mm-hmm. here's, my, here's my sound, you know, with all these things put together. Mm, I like that, that phrase you said, be like water. Right. So do you practice any type of uh, Tai Chi or something? You no, know, no. Kind of I'm a fan of Bruce Lee's movies, though. Okay, yeah, okay. So, um, I guess learn it through osmosis. Right, right. right. So <laughs> I mean, I to me, anybody that is great at something, you can borrow something from them. Mm-hmm. You know, when you watch a Bruce Lee movie, it's like it's clear he operates on a level mm-hmm. very different than than everybody else. So it's like there's something in what you're doing I can learn. And and that that could be for yeah. anybody. Yeah. Anybody that's hyper I mean Michael Jordan was my still is like my favorite basketball player of all time. Mm-hmm. Now, especially after watching The Last Dance, there are things about Michael Jordan you probably don't want to copy. Okay. All but right. then the the dedication to yeah. your craft was one of those like, oh no, well, if you're going to be great, yeah. There is a cost. Yes. Are you willing to pay the cost? And and one of the things I've learned is most people aren't and you can rub a lot of people the wrong way when you are mm. and a lot of people aren't. Mm. So that's also something as you get older, learning how to navigate. You know, some people want to be OK at music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some people want to be good at music. Mm-hmm. Some people want to be like great mm-hmm. at music. And you got to figure out, well, how can I do that yeah. and still operate and still function with people and not. So, you know, all those things, it, it takes like years of maturity. Mm-hmm. I mean, you watch that in that Michael Jordan documentary. Mm, like see, just watching nah, him. Let like, me watch that tonight. Oh, yeah. Watching how he deals with his teammates. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, had that same. Mm-hmm. We're going to win. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to like me. Yeah. But we're yeah. going to win. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, trying to take things from people who do things like how can I push myself to be as great as I can be at what I'm doing? Wow. So are you like that with your your 
crewmates or your bandmates? Or I they would just think are okay. people who know me would say mm-hmm. I'm pretty straightforward and to the point and about improving. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As I've gotten older, I've gotten, I wouldn't say easier going. I found different tacks mm-hmm. in how to do it. But no, when I was. Well, you have a son now, so I well, know yeah, that also your that heart. changes. <laughs> That changes how you do things. But, no, I'm still mm-hmm. very much a uh, – and I, and I teach that way. Mm-hmm. And, again, it, it changes as you get older, but it's very much like we're trying to get from A to B. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I don't need all the other little excuses why we can't do it. It's just like we need to get to A to B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so – but also when you're like, – like I work a lot with, like I said, Jeremy on drums. I mean, he's older yes. than me. That's not required. We have conversations about the music. You know, because it's two professional people trying to figure out. Yeah. You know, but younger people, it'll be like, you know, like I had um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. John Curry and Lance Scott on my record, My Americana. Mm-hmm. So there were moments when we were recording where they didn't want to redo something. I was like, I don't care. You know, it doesn't wow. sound right. Yeah. You know, like I remember a specific time, Lance missed a note. It was one note. Just one? It was one note. Okay. And I listened back and I was like, all right, go back and do it. He's like, man, I just, I was like, don't care. Was it written? Yeah, it was like a okay. written line. So okay. it was it wasn't obvious, but it was obvious to me. Yeah. yeah. He's like, I gotta do the whole thing. I was like, Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get the note right. You know, so so to me, but to me that's not I don't think necessarily that's being overbearing. I think in a world where standards are starting to mean less and less mm. when you hold a standard it looks like you're being overbearing yeah so if you're surrounded by anarchy and yeah. you're like well no we're going to do this everybody's like oh he's being hard it's yeah like, well no it might be everybody else is just kind of being i mean the perfect example is when i was young yeah i remember playing baseball and i remember we got to like the championship game and we lost mm-hmm. there were no second place trophies mm-hmm. so i remember sitting on the little hill it was at campus hills I remember sitting on the hill, eating my orange slice, crying, oh. watching the other team celebrate. Yeah. Um, and there were no trophies. The coach was just like, well, you know, we'll try and get them next time. Mm. Um, a similar time, I remember playing basketball, uh, and we were down by three points. Mm-hmm. I got fouled shooting a three-pointer. Mm-hmm. No time left. Mm-hmm. If I hit the three free throws, mm-hmm. game goes overtime. Missed all three. <sighs> so I'm walking out uh, – and my dad, I'm like kicking trash cans. Yeah. And my dad's like, what you so mad about? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Did you just see what happens? He's yeah. like, let me ask you a question. He's like, do you practice free throws? Like you practice piano? Ooh. I was like, no, nah, but he was like, shut up. <laughs> and so for me, yeah. I was mad at the time. But looking back, what he was saying was, yeah. you don't work at it. Mm. You don't deserve to be good at it. Mm. You know, and so that's kind of the way I approach teaching. I approach like playing in the band is just like, how are you expecting to do something when you literally spend like the bare minimal of time? And so I remember that that brings tears to yeah, my eyes. But one you, of the lessons yeah. I had, I remember one of my students mm-hmm. when I was at ECU was getting frustrated, mm-hmm. and he said, "Well, you don't understand. You, you were a prodigy." And I was like, "See, that's where you're wrong." Mm. I was like, "My first audition in college, I got third. Mm. Um, I didn't even make the top band. Uh, I was not a project. I worked hard. Mm-hmm. I was like, now, yeah, do I probably have some talent that allows the hard work? Yes. I was like, but what you don't, you don't want to work hard. Mm-hmm. And it's easy for you to say, oh, well, Ernest, you always. I was like, no, if I let you hear me playing in high school, you'd be like, that, that Same sounds, guy? that sounds, right. <laughs> or even my college, mm-hmm. you know, my college uh, recital. People would not think that's the same person. It's like, it's work. Like mm-hmm. all these things is, are you willing to put in the work? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and so those are, I feel like I use it. I mean, I'm like that way with my son. Yeah. He likes to play piano. How old uh, is he again? He's six. He'll be seven okay. in a few months. Okay. And so he likes to play piano. Yeah. But he doesn't like to practice. Okay. But he yeah. likes to play piano when people are around. Okay. And so he likes to play songs when people are like watching and then he'll make a mistake and he'll keep messing up and then he'll be like, <laughs> he'll, he'll be one immediately like, yeah. And I'm like, nah, nope. chief. <laughs> and so, but I mean, I tell my son I love him every day. I give him yeah. hugs, but it's just like. You're not getting this one. Mm-hmm. Like, this is going to have to be one of those lessons where, and I tell him, I was like, you might not understand this now. I was like, but as you get older, you'll understand that there's going to be a lot of things that are tough. Mm-hmm. And you got to make a decision how you want to handle it. Do you want to quit or do you want to see it through? I was like, but anything that, that, that you see somebody doing, like there's a kid across the street that plays basketball, about 14. He's like, I want to play basketball. I was like, well, I've been at this house for nine years. 
every day I see that kid outside dribbling that basketball. Oh, wow. The boy's like a teenager now, like maybe 15 or something. But mm-hmm. when we moved in, he was like six. Mm-hmm. He was outside dribbling a basketball mm-hmm. every day for years. And now when you watch him, oh, he could do the step backs. Mm-hmm. He can shoot. My son sees that. He's like, oh, I want to play. I was yeah. like, that's cool. We can go down to the court. Mm-hmm. But we got to go every yeah. day. So Every day. So, yeah, yeah for me, it's just basics. consistency, mm-hmm. discipline. You know, it's no secret. It's you just got to sit and work hard at it, even when it's looking like there's no reason to work hard at it. So, mm. I know the first uh, time that you tried out or went to the competition for the Jazz Pre, you won second place. Yeah, we got second. Yeah. But the second we almost, time, almost, yeah, <laughs> almost, yeah. and no reward, no, no reward, trophy, just go home, pat mad. on the back. Yeah, we just got in the van and <laughs> rolled back to Durham, mad. Just. Yeah. <laughs> Was it a, just a quiet car? Well, no, I mean, because it was, because <laughs> that, that first band was Michael O'Day, yeah. uh, who's doing great things now, went on to play with Joey DiFrancesco, and I think plays with, is it Theo Croker? I want to, either trumpet mm. player, yeah. Mm. So, I mean, doing great things, and then Lance was playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I told them, I was just like, this is life. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. I mean, it was a long car ride back from D.C. Yeah. Uh, the second time I went with the band I played with now, Jeremy and uh, Kevin. You won. How, how much did you win? It was again? fifteen grand. Yeah, so <laughs> smiling so oh, hard. Oh yeah, it's easy to cheese when you holding the check for fifteen thousand. <laughs> Not so much if you had to go home broke. So oh man, and expecting to win. Right, right. But you got it right the second time. Yes, beautiful. So when did you start playing with Stephen Riley? Was that a call gig? Or? No, no. So the the story with Steve is is I mean Steve is actually a very very close and dear friend of mine. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit mm-hmm. in goodness at this point what was it august 05 mm-hmm. yeah uh i left new orleans i was in the middle of grad school and my i was starting my second year of grad school and i came back to durham and i was thinking oh well i'll just hang out for a couple of weeks move back to new orleans that was not a viable option yeah. um, and yeah. so i was like well is there a school i can go to mm-hmm. and maybe like finish out my degree like do classes yeah. and then like send it or work something out with university of new orleans and so at the time east carolina was the only school in north carolina for grad degree mm-hmm. that is the only reason yeah. i went to green so a, a large part of my life was literally happenstance if okay. central had a degree they had now it would just awesome. gone down the street and mm-hmm. and so i get down there and uh i'm just like oh my god it's like what what my God my God why is that forsaking me like why am I in Greenville North Carolina, uh, and so, you know I get down there I'm, I'm very very unhappy I'm just like mm. this this you can't live in New Orleans and then living like you know so yeah. but maybe one of like the first or second week I was there, one of the students is like have you heard of Stephen Riley he's this great saxophonist mm. I had never heard of him and of course I'm thinking like. When they say great, it's great for Greenville. Oh, so I, they, there's a gig happening. They had like a regular gig on campus, like in the student union or something. So I'm going, and I'm like, "This is going to be terrible. This is not going." And I hear somebody playing. And I thought it was the radio. Okay. And I walk in, and I heard Steve playing. I was just like, oh. "Who is this guy? And why have I never heard him play?" Yeah. yeah. And so we hit it off. I think, you know, for for a lot of personal reasons too at that time in our lives we were both dealing with you know personal things that we kind of mm-hmm. hit it off yeah and kind of kind of synced with each other so we mm-hmm. played a lot at the school and i remember uh like the second time we were playing he's like hey man i want you to play on my record mm-hmm. and and i i know he had his previous records were trio with neil kane who plays bass with harry connor jr and then jason marsalis mm-hmm. on drums oh so I thought he was just doing because that is one of the things that in mu- music you hear that a lot. Yeah. People say, "Oh, I'm gonna call you." Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a, and it never happens. Yeah. So he said, "I was like, all right, man, whatever." So that's probably 05. I get a call, and we kept in touch. But 07, he's like, all right, man, uh, New Jersey. That's where we record. Mm. And so he actually like kept his word, put me on that first record, El Gaucho, mm-hmm. which to to be perfectly honest was one of the things that kind of kept me kind of going, because living in Greenville, I, I felt very cut off from music mm-hmm. felt like maybe that's not what i'm supposed to be doing performing maybe wow. i'm just gonna be a teacher really yeah because i mean there's nothing going on you know you're i mean you're in a very yeah rural place. i was trying to think back to it. right and so yeah and so that doing that performance like doing that record with him and then i think we did one in 09 the lucky seven uh and then also in 09 i did the the tour with brian horton mm-hmm. going overseas through the state department mm-hmm. so those were the kind of things that kind of keep you yeah you know, so that's why, you know, to this day, I mean, me and Steve have been friends for 15 years. But I, I mean, he he's dear to me because 
I mean, he he helped me at a time. I was like, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. But then when I played with him and Neil Kane and Jason, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. like this is it fits. Yeah, this fits. I just yeah. I gotta figure out how to get back to it. So, well, so yeah. yeah, that's how I met Steve, and we've been friends and playing together. We actually, have a duo record coming out sometime. You know, probably in the next year or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, been good friends. Played a lot, a lot of gigs and stuff together since. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I see that El Gacho is take two. What what's up with take one? It's not up here. Oh, I don't even know why we did. <laughs> I mean, I think he liked both versions, so he just put both versions on the record. I mean, it was so long ago. It was like oh seven we did, but I, I think yeah. yeah we recorded the song twice, and he felt that we played it differently. So he was just like, all right, Probably. I'll put up El Gacho one and El Gacho two on the record. Yeah. Well, when we get back, we'll play El Gacho take two. We're gonna listen to a promo first, and then we'll be back. Thank you. 
90.7 WNCU member supporter radio with Stephen Riley as the tenor saxophonist on that song and on keys piano. Let me clarify, Ernest Turner and he's in the studio today, a part of the WNCU Cares Artist Series, and that was El Gacho. Take two, I guess one day. Well, we'll if you go, you know, and you get these albums, you can hear, you can support. Ernest Turner, he actually has some uh, music on Spotify, and he's posting on Instagram and on Facebook sometimes. I guess sometimes. So- yeah. yeah. <laughs> sometimes, and you can you can certainly get in contact with him. He's a Durham native, and uh, he's approachable. So look him up. Um, I we're getting to I guess the top of the set. I don't want this to end, but we have to end it at some point. But I want to play some more music from Stephen Riley's album, just as a highlight. Actually, there's an El Gacho take three. Oh goodness, I don't know. That's <laughs> probably. <laughs> I think we'll just keep it at take two for now. Um, is there any other song that you liked on this, on his album? It's been so. I mean, that yeah. record we did that in '07. So I. To be honest, I don't remember the name. Yeah, <laughs> the names yeah. of the songs on it. Uh, I I do remember when I listened. I, I do feel like it was a pretty strong record. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to I, honestly. I don't remember any of the. Yeah, oh, Central we did Park. Central Park West. Uh, we did that as a waltz. Okay, so that might be interesting. Yeah, it might be interesting. Let's get to that, and then we get back. We'll talk a little more about your musical career, and maybe what are you doing now? Ah, okay. So here's Central Park West.
Central Park West, Stephen Riley, Ernest Turner, and you name the bassist and the drummer. It was Neil Kane, the bassist for Hair Country, and then the great Jason Marsalis on drums. <sighs> what a good tune. Uh, that would have been the, uh, a great tune to end to the top of the set. But, nope, we have more. When you're listening to WNCU Cares Artists Series with Ernest Turner, and it's that time. Oh, my goodness. This is great. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that you will be able to check the archives on YouTube soon. Um, Ernest Turner, you can find him at ErnestTurner.com. You can find him on Instagram. You can find him in Durham walking down the street with his family. <laughs> with a mask on. With a mask on. It, <laughs> you had to say that. You know, he just brings us right back to reality. <laughs> This is WNCU Cares Artist Series by way of Jazz Stage. That is by way of WNCU 90.7. And um, there's one more song that I want to get to, and this is from your My Americana album. But uh, what are you doing in today's world? Uh, what projects are you working uh, on? Uh, it's 2020. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, I think it's. I think I'm slowly coming back around to looking at music. Mm -hmm. I think the last few months I've kind of taken a hiatus, like a mm -hmm. needed one, and not really, because it, it could get a little depressing. Okay. And so I kind of just didn't worry about it. So I guess now I'm slowly gearing back up to, you know, have a concert coming up um, that the thing in Cam and Wilmington mm -hmm. is streaming. And then also uh, doing a collaboration with Lois DeLoach, the mm -hmm. vocalist. So uh, I don't know when that's going to, but we're we'll probably be working on like a, a album sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Um so things are starting to, well, I know mentally I'm starting to kind of re-engage. Yeah. Uh, I feel yeah. like with most people you just kind of hunker down yeah. and spend time with your family. And so I'm slowly getting back into that, okay, mm -hmm. musician mode, like what, what projects are coming up, let me start getting ready. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Okay. Because I could hear you for days. Oh, listening. no, thank you. <laughs> I could like, talk yep, to that's people. It. That could be a good or bad thing. Because you're a scholar and you're well learned and I love it. You've been listening to Ernest Turner tell great stories, and I appreciate you for coming oh, here. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe down the line we can get your band in here. Oh, yes, that'd be great. That'd yeah. be awesome. So here's In and Out, um, In or Out, and you have a story maybe for this one? I know you said. It, it, I was uh, on a deadline yeah. to name the songs. Jason Richmond, a uh, great guy who actually was the sound engineer for the, and he mastered it. But he sent me an email. He's like, man, I need titles mm -hmm. for when I do this. I was like, uh. So I literally, I looked around a room, and I, I had a Thanos t-shirt, so that's why I got Return of Thanos. Yeah. Uh, there was a poster with circles on it, so I was like, circles was one. And then I just thought about, it was a, this is like an up kind of energetic song. I remember being a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, a lot of kids can attest to this, especially if you're from, you know, rural areas. Yeah. That, you know, if you go outside and keep coming back in and out of the house, they're like, mm -hmm. stop wasting my good air. <laughs> so they'd be like, in or out, you gotta be in or out. So oh, I just right. remember, I was like, hey, that works, in or out, so... Here we go, yep. in or out. This is 90.7 WNCU, member supporter radio.
This is Wynton Marcellus. When you think jazz, think 90.7 FM, WNCU Durham, and WNCU.org. I know I'm thinking it.